Well, that beautiful lament was written by Palestrina almost 500 years ago and uh, offered for us as a gift of praise this morning. We turn to a psalm even older than that, which will come alive. This is the power of God's word, ever living, ever fresh. I uh, invite you to turn in your Bibles to Psalm 116. It's our last Friday Psalm of the Quad. I want to begin with a uh, story I may have told you before, but I want to tell it with a different uh, detail and perhaps different emphasis and set it in the context of Psalm 116 as a song of answered prayer. It's a story of a girl named Allie who uh, stood at her locker in the hallway of her middle school and sensed the overwhelming urge to pray for the eighth grade boy across the hallway. He wasn't really her type, to be honest, and yet she sensed the Spirit of God whispering his name and saying, pray for him. What Allie didn't fully understand at the time was how badly Heath needed her prayers. She was busy at school and at church. She was involved in cheerleading and other activities her youth group. Meanwhile, Heath was getting more and more involved in satanic activities. I had regular encounters with the demonic realm, he later wrote, becoming addicted to numerous drugs, looked like a human skeleton, and lived life in quiet desperation. Later on in high school, when Heath was tripping on LSD, another classmate invited him to church, and he actually went. And later that night, as he was lying in bed and thinking about what he had heard, he opened his heart to the love of God. With tears streaming down his face, he prayed for the first time in his life out loud, Jesus, you are who you say you are. Shortly afterwards, Heath went forward at another church service. He repented of his sins. He publicly confessed faith in Jesus Christ, and instantly he was healed totally delivered from those addictions and demonic temptations. The very next day, a, an envelope arrived in Heath's mailbox. It was from that girl across the hall. She had been carrying the letter for weeks, uncertain whether to send it until another moment came when the Holy Spirit prompted her to put it in the mailbox. She wanted Heath to know that Jesus loved him. She had never stopped praying for him. Later on, after they got married, <laughs> I guess he was her type after all, Heath looked through Allie's prayer journal and he discovered how long she had been praying for him and how many specific prayers God had answered. And here's what he wrote as his testimony. I am the product of a girl who dared to believe when God whispered, an invitation to church, the power of prayer, and the Savior who stepped into my darkness and instead of turning away in horror, showed me who he was and who I was created to be. Now, the circumstances may differ, but the story of Heath Adamson is really the testimony of every believer in Christ. Jesus has stepped into our darkness to make us the people we were created to be. And he has done this as the answer to prayer. Partly our own desperate cries for mercy and almost always, I, I think always, the prayers of people who loved us enough to intercede for us. And this was also the experience of the songwriter who wrote Psalm 116. He had a song in his heart because God heard him and answered him. And, and so he began his psalm. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy because he inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call on him as long as I live. Now, it is always nice to be heard, but never more so than when the one who hears you is the God of the universe. And here the psalmist so beautifully depicts God leaning forward to make sure that, that he hears exactly what we have to say. Like a, 
a doctor leaning over the bed of a patient or a mother or father tucking a child in at night and, and leaning close to have those last words of the day. God listens that way when we pray. And the psalmist really needed a divine ear because his situation was so totally, absolutely desperate. He writes in this psalm about the snares of death encompassing him. him. Death is, is closing in. There seems to be no way out. It's, it's an emotional agony as well as a physical danger. I, I suffered distress and anguish, he says. Later, he tells us how many tears he shed during those desperate days. And maybe worst of all, no one came to rescue him. In, page, in uh, verses 10 and 11, you'll see some quotation marks. I think what is happening here is the, the psalmist is sharing a couple of pages from his prayer journal. He's showing us what he wrote during some of the worst days of his life. I am greatly afflicted. That's one of the things he wrote. All mankind are liars. There's, there's another thing. We don't know exactly who wrote the psalm or specifically when he wrote it. I think that's part of its beauty. Here is a psalm that is open-ended enough that you can find yourself somewhere in its stanzas. Do you ever think there is no way out? Do you ever feel the anguish of anxiety? Do you ever believe that no one around you can be trusted? What the psalmist did when he felt that way is what we should all do when we are in distress. He prayed to the living God. And this was the turning point in his life. He, he says, then I called on the name of the Lord and everything else followed from that, that, that moment of prayer. And he, he proceeds to share another quotation from his prayer journal. He lets us know, this is the end of verse four, exactly what he prayed. O oh Lord, I prayed, deliver my soul. Here is a really good verse to underline, uh, which points to the value of a printed copy of God's word, I suppose. Uh, it's a verse certainly to go back to, to mark and return to in any desperate situation. Oh Lord, deliver my soul. There's a really good all-purpose prayer that covers a lot of situations in life. And what you will find when you use that prayer is that when you call on the name of the Lord, he hears and answers your prayers for mercy. I think it's significant and important to notice in this psalm that even when he was going through what, what seemed to be the worst days of his life, the psalmist never forgot where to turn for help and never totally lost his faith in what God could do. You look at verses 10 and 11 again, you see how afflicted he was, how cynical he had become about the people around him. They're all liars, he said. But those verses also contain this remarkable testimony of enduring faith. On his darkest day, he said, I believed even when I spoke I am greatly afflicted. Even then, even when he was saying those things about his sufferings and about the people around him, even at that moment, the songwriter was still a believer. It was such a crisis, all he could really think about was his sufferings, but he still held on to Almighty God. He believed in God at least enough to pray, and that made all the difference. I wonder if you find yourself sometimes prone to spiritual doubts, tempted to be cynical about the people around you, particularly other Christians. One of the main ways that we make it through all our doubts and difficulties is by believing in God enough to cry out to him for help. Whatever you do, whatever you're going through, don't stop praying. And when the psalmist kept praying, even when he was going through all of this, he found God answering his prayers. That was the first thing that he told us at the very beginning of this psalm. The Lord heard my voice. That's the starting point. And my pleas for mercy. He goes on later in the psalm in verses 8 and 9 to give us more of his testimony. You have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. 
I read those verses, I can't help but think of the testimony that we have of through faith in Jesus Christ, that through his death and resurrection, we also have a testimony of life after death, of out of death deliverance. We were spiritually dead, but we are not spiritually dead anymore. We are eternally alive. And one day in glory, we will be able to look back and we will see everything that God ever did to deliver us was an answer to prayer. You might think of your life and your testimony and your spiritual pilgrimage in this context. It's just one answered prayer after another. For many of us, from the very first moment that our parents prayed for the gift of our lives, think of all the times that you were anxious or sick or in trouble or had some other desperate problem and you asked God to heal you and rescue you and, and give you peace. And think of all the other times way beyond that when other people prayed for you. Your parents perhaps, a mentor or pastor, classmates, other people who care about you. Think of all the very specific petitions that people prayed for you and think of all of the general prayers that the Holy Spirit took and then applied by his grace to your specific situation. I suppose it's a good thing that heaven lasts forever because it will take us the better part of eternity just to praise God for all the answers to all the prayers that were ever offered for us. This is a psalm of answered prayer. Now this psalmist's near-death experience had many positive results in his life. I just want to mention some of them briefly. If you, if you study this psalm carefully, you'll see more than the ones I mentioned, but I, I do want to mention a few of them. There are so many things that happened in his life because he, he prayed and then God answered his prayers and then there was a, a spiritual result in the, in that spilled over into the rest of his life. The gift of answered prayer made him, here's the first thing, a better lover. In fact, the psalm opened with a declaration of his love. I love the Lord. Why do I love the Lord? Because of answered prayer. He's heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. The, the relationship we have with God is a living, loving friendship. And one of the main ways we know that God loves us is because he answers our prayers. Prayers of deliverance and forgiveness. Prayers for daily bread and protection. Prayers for help in times of trouble. See those answered prayers and you will see your love for God grow. Here's another result of the gift of answered prayer. It made the psalmist a more faithful intercessor. Of course it did. Because the more he prayed, the more God answered. And the more God answered, the more persuaded he was of the power of prayer. And so the more he prayed. That's, that's the logic of verse 2. Because he inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call on him as long as I live. You just try it for yourself and see, the more you pray and the more you see God answer, the more you want to pray until it becomes a lifelong habit. I hope it becomes that kind of habit for you. Here's another positive result of seeing God answer prayer. The psalmist became a stronger theologian. As he reflected on what God had done, after all that he had been through, he could only testify to God's goodness and grace. We see this in the second main stanza of the psalm. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. When I was brought low, he saved me. This is the, the kind of God that the psalmist experienced through prayer. A gracious God who gives you what you don't deserve. A righteous God who is faithful to keep his promises. A merciful God who has compassion on your sad condition. In a word, God is good. I wonder if you can do this liturgy with me this morning. If I say God is good, what do you say? All the time. And all the time? That's the point that the psalmist reached as he reflected on the goodness of God, what he had learned of these divine attributes, which of course he learned when he had been brought very low. So often that's the case. It's by this experience of being in a bad place, so bad that you're compelled to pray for help and then seeing how God rescues you, that's, that's what teaches you the character of God. And now it never would have happened for the psalmist unless he also had a teachable spirit. 
People sometimes can go through suffering after suffering and they never learn from it the way that the psalmist did. Notice, notice the way he describes himself in verse six. The Lord preserves the simple. I like seeing that word in this psalm. He's not commenting here on his limited intellectual capacities. He is talking about a simple, humble, childlike trust in God. Here is somebody who didn't make his spiritual life any more complicated than it needed to be. When he was in trouble, he asked God to help him, and then he just trusted God to do what was best. And we shouldn't make our spiritual lives any more complicated than they need to be either. You will get as far as you need to go in life simply by praying to God with a humble and teachable spirit and then completely trusting and resting in him. Now, I'm not saying that's easy to do. I don't think it was easy for the psalmist because I noticed the way that he has to preach to himself in verse 7. Return, O my soul, to your rest. He had wandered away from that restful place. He knew that his soul wasn't where it should be. It was anxious and, and worried and troubled and caught up in all of these things. But as the psalmist preached the gospel to his soul, the good news of God's grace and mercy and righteousness, as he communicated all of that again with himself, he was able to return to this place of rest. Here's another marvelous verse to commit to memory. Return, O my soul, to your rest, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. It's a verse that Mrs. Riken and I have up on a wall in our home. It's a good reminder not to worry about things that you can't control anyway, and also to reflect on how good God has been to you. He has dealt bountifully with you. I'm telling you, seeing God answer your prayers has many positive results. It makes you a better lover of God, a more faithful intercessor, a stronger theologian. Here's another thing. It'll make you a more joyful worshiper. We should keep in mind this very personal psalm was actually meant to be sung in public worship. The psalmist had this personal experience of answered prayer. He was almost dead, but God delivered him. And, and then he asked the question, what should I do in response to that? All of this grace that God has given to me, we should ask ourselves the same questions. Everything that God has done for us in Jesus Christ, what, this is the way the psalmist puts it in verse 12, what shall I render to the Lord for his benefits to me? My sins are forgiven. My debt is paid. My destiny is secure. Now, what shall I offer to God in return? It's a tough question because we don't really have anything that God didn't give us in the first place. It all belongs to him already anyway. So what, what do you give to the person who gave you everything? I guess the only thing we have left to give, which is our gratitude. That's what the psalmist did. He said, I, I know what I'll do. I will, I'll lift up a cup of salvation. I'll call on the name of the Lord. I will enter into the place of worship and give God praise. We're catching a little glimpse here of the way the Israelites worshiped at the temple in Jerusalem. And from time to time, when God had blessed a person in some specific way, that person would come with a thank offering, not as a, not as a sacrifice for sin. It was simply a gift of gratitude. And here the psalmist brings a drink offering. You can read about it in the book of Numbers. It's a, it's a holy libation for his salvation. And apparently he had promised God that he would do this because a number of times in the closing verses, he mentioned the vows that he had made to the Lord. I'm going I'm to fulfill my vow. I'm going to keep my vow. This is what I had vowed to do. You see, at the time of his deliverance, he made God a promise. I am going to go to the temple and I am going to worship you for what you have done in my life. And here as he wrote this song and then as he sang this song in the company of the, the congregation, he was doing the thing that he had promised to do. He had, he had become a more joyful worshiper because of the way that God had answered his prayer. And so he wanted to give glory to God as we should do and as we do do whenever we gather for worship and sing the praise of Christ for our salvation. Well, I want to close this morning with what I think of as the most beautiful verse in this psalm. Really, for me, one of the most beautiful verses in the Bible. It's a verse often recited at funerals. 
It's verse 15. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Why are we so precious to God? We're precious because we're saints, that is, holy ones. Not, not referring to a specific category of super believers, but really to every child of God who trusts in the Lord and is made holy by his grace. We too, even people like us, are the holy ones in this biblical sense, and we're precious to God as a result because he has made us holy. We're precious to God because we belong to him. The possessive pronoun is important here. It's the death of his saints. We belong to God. He made us. He takes care of us. He has paid the price of our redemption through the death of his son on the cross. I like how Augustine talked about this. He said, on the cross, Jesus transacted a grand exchange. It was there that the purse containing our price was untied. And when his side was laid open by the lance of the executioner, there poured out from it the price of the whole wide world. We are the blood-bought children of God as precious to him as his own beloved son. We're precious to God. I mean, I could, I could give so many reasons for this. We're precious to God, obviously, because of all the prayers he's answered on our behalf. He's, he's invested something in us. That's the main theme of this psalm. But we are never more precious to God than at the moment of death. When the portals of glory are opened and when Jesus receives us unto himself. That is part of the testimony of verse 15. And in those moments of death, so often, God affirms how precious his children are to him by giving them some assurance of his loving presence. I love the story of the, the dying hours of D.L. Moody. During his last day on earth, it was evident to Moody and eventually to others that he was hovering somewhere between heaven and earth. God was calling him home, and he, he told the people at his bedside about some of the glimpses that he was getting of, of the coming glory. I have seen beyond the gates of death, he testified, into the very portals of heaven. Now, during the previous year, the Moody family had suffered a tragic loss through the death of two small grandchildren. You can imagine how deeply touched his family members were when Moody, when Moody suddenly cried out, Dwight, Irene, I see the children's faces. No one who was there with Moody that day could doubt the truth of this verse. Precious in the sight of God is the death of his saints. Thinking of Moody's testimony drew me back to the day when my friend Hannah died. Her hospital room in Philadelphia was crowded with family members and the closest friends. And as she drew her final breaths, I happened to notice the song that was playing quietly in the background. It was just the tune, but I knew the words and reflected on them. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, come home, come home. You who are weary, come home. And it was a reminder to me and became a blessed assurance to the family that softly and tenderly in those moments, Jesus was calling his precious daughter home to her everlasting rest. My hope for you, and also for me, is a death blessed in some way by the living presence of God. I want to die the way that I have tried to live, loving, believing, serving, worshiping, and also praying. And maybe the last prayer that God will answer is a prayer I think we should offer every time we happen to think of our own mortality. Lord, Grant me the grace one day, one day to die in Christian faith, fully trusting in my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. And God will answer that prayer by receiving us unto himself. And after that, this psalm, I think, will be as useful to us as ever. <laughs>
Because all of these words, I think, will make just as much sense in the light of eternity. See what you think. How do they sound from that perspective? I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy because he has inclined his ear to me. I will call on him as long as I live. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful for you have delivered my soul from death and my eyes from tears. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I will offer the sacrifice of thanksgiving. I will call on the name of the Lord in the presence of all his people in the courts of the house of the Lord. Praise the Lord. That's what the psalmist said. That's what I say. I hope it's what you say. Praise the Lord.